Brilliant. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm uh, Daniel Suslak, the director of the IU Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. And we're really pleased that everybody could be here with us today for this event to uh, celebrate the very recent publication of the new uh, edited volume, Clase Obrera y Dictadura Militar in Argentina, 1976 to 1983. And uh, we're joined today by uh, the two editors of the volume, uh, Dr. Luciana Sorsoli and Dr. Juan Pedro Massano, as, as well as um, Edward Bredney, who's a contributor to the volume, uh, an IU alumnus. And I think it, this event was originally his idea. So uh, many thanks to Ed, Edward for the original uh, inspiration to do this. Um, I also want to take just a second to thank uh, Sonia Manriquez, our associate director, and Aaron Brown, our very amazing graduate assistant uh, who helped to set this up. So um, I think in just a second here, I'm going to go ahead and slip off the screen and let Dr. Angela Vergara take over the conversation. But the plan is to have uh, Dr. Vergara uh, uh, sort of basically moderate uh, a conversation between uh, uh, Luciana, Juan Pedro, and Edward, and, and, um, and if you were interested in um, commenting or asking questions, uh, you can um, put something in the chat, and at the end of the hour, we'll reserve some time to, uh, to um, uh, read and react to your thoughts and have a dialogue. Uh, so, um, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to Dr. Angela Berga, who uh, joins us from California. I should say this is a, a tricontinental affair. Luciana is in England right now. Uh, Juan Pedro is in Argentina, I believe, and Edward is in the exotic far off land of, of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, but we're making it work. So, um, Angela Vergara is a historian and expert in, in Chilean uh, history and society. And uh, we're very pleased that she could join us today for this event. So without further ado, I'll uh, we'll hand it over to uh, Angela. Many thanks, Dan. And I think um, it's a great pleasure to moderate this book um, presentation and celebration. Um, and I think especially like as a Chilean labor historian, I think in some ways I have always looked into what I would call the Eastern Slope of the Andes um, as one of the places with one of the most vibrant labor historiography. I think as a Chilean scholar, I have always been a little bit jealous of how intense and how there's so many um, studies. And what I, one of the things I like about this book, and I just want to talk for five minutes and then get started with some questions, is that it really brings together both the tradition to study the workplace, to study the factory, to go back to those experiences with those larger reflection about labor politics and labor mobilization. And I think that is somehow um, one of the great accomplishments of the book, that it really goes us to see, okay, we had the factory, but also we have this larger issues. So just briefly, I think it's a book about the workers, um, but it's also a book about the importance of bringing labor history as one important chapter to understand the history of dictatorship. It somehow brings the idea that you cannot understand dictatorship, the repression, but also the economic restructuring without understanding labor. And I think that is one of the strengths of the book. It's also a book not only about repression, but also economic restructuring. And I think that's a fascinating question, especially that I haven't seen that much that about Argentina. I've seen the political repression, but I haven't seen much of that economic restructuring. And the articles really bring that into the, um, the different analysis. It's also a book that it takes you around Argentina. It's like taking this bus trip around all these highways and going from Córdoba all the way to wine workers in Mendoza to Bahia Blanca. And I love that about the book because many times we get a very regional, only Buenos Aires focused uh, labor history. And this one gets a sort of more complicated view, a more diverse view of Argentine labor um, history. Um, I think it's also a book that brings, and we can get that conversation going, but also to see how workers change during the dictatorship. And although from a Chilean perspective, the dictatorship looks kind of short, you know, it's 76 to 83, but it really 
highlights the idea that worker change, the workplace change, and what it means to be a worker in Argentina changed dramatically during the time of dictatorship. Not only how, lay, how workers resisted, how they organized, but also the everyday experience of working in a factory or working in a plant or in an office. Um, I think one of the things before I start with the question, I really enjoyed their bottom up approach to really understand these different uh, places. I love the ways in which they connect with the historiography. And I think one of the things that is always so hard with the collective um, on editing volume is to glue all the chapters. And the editors did a fantastic job really bringing them all together around one big historiographical question. And they all address that. And you can see then how that um, develop through the different um, cases. So um, I want to start with a broad question maybe to the editors um, or whoever wants to answer that, if they can tell us a little bit about the idea of this book, how it came around, um, how did they start, um, how they was conceived. Oh, shall I go Juan Pedro? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start. Thank you, Angela, for, for, for the kind words and for seeing so much in the book. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure that you, you have this idea of the chapters and the effort we have done. So the idea, I think you, you recover part of what it was behind this project uh, well. One thing was linking the dictatorship history with labor history. And this is a need uh, that we saw in Argentinian in both fields of work. So I was saying in another presentation a few days ago that if you stand in front of a shelf of books about a dictatorship, you will be a little bit lost in terms of labor history. There is a very, there is a, you know, uh, we all know this, the Argentinian dictatorship has been studied a lot. It's a very important and interesting topic within Argentinian historiography. At the same time, and because of the way in which the history of the dictatorship was built, uh, the role of workers, the impact of workers uh, on workers of the dictatorship, the restructuring you were mentioning, and the repression they suffer has been, let's say, if not in, if it's not invisible, is considered less important than what it was the representation of the victim of the dictatorship, which was the middle classes and the students and, the, and those participating in organizations of political struggle. So bringing back the role, the importance of the working class conflict and the capital workers conflict during the previous peri period and the dictatorship itself is part of what is behind the idea. Second thing which is behind this book is the book was organized because it was the anniversary of the publication of a very classical book on this uh, topic, which is Pablo Posse's work. And so we said, okay, let's see what has changed in labor history about this period, 40 years after the first publication about the topic, or one of the first. And I think we have found very good and new things around, and we will discuss this during this hour. But I think, you know, those are, were the two things that I think were behind the motive of the book. I don't know, Juan Pedro, if you want to add something to this. And I think that is very clear in the book, the sort of really um, revising Argentine labor history and really sort of in tune with the larger debates about Argentine dictatorship. And I think in connection with that, the other thing uh, that really struck me, as I mentioned before, is this big geographical scope that I haven't seen in many other Argentine labor history. But it made me think about the proposal of Gabriela Aguila in her book about Rosario and dictatorship, the need to think about dictators, but different from the regional perspective, to think about to decentralize the history of dictatorship. So um, how that debate also plays out in your, uh, in your work? Um, how do you see your, uh, all these articles contributing to, to bring out the sort of different regional experiences? What is different? What is, I mean, I think one of the challenges is, I mean, there's one narrative of labor under dictatorship, but when you bring the different regions, what changed or what remained the same? Well, um, Gabriel Aguilar made a very important contribution 
uh, to understanding the relational differences of uh, repression by highlighting the operational decentralization of the systematic repression plan. Uh, in this sense, it was expected that when you gather in uh, research on the experience of workers from different geographical areas, important difference uh, will be shown regarding those experience. Uh, at the same time, works such as that by Laura Rodriguez on the Mendoza wine workers or others such as um, Susana Roitmans or Daniel Di Cosimo on factory workers located in urban certain, not as large at Cordoba, Rosario or Buenos Aires, uh, allow us to see differences that have to do with the specific places in the productive structure uh, where this experience occurs. Uh, it seems to me that the book makes a double effort. Uh, on the one hand, it responds to Gabriela Aguilas' call to rescue the regional dimension of the work experience during the dictatorships. Uh, on the other hand, it is so not to remain in an anecdote of the similar experience, but rather to integrate these uh, specificities, specificities uh, sorry, uh, by understanding them in a microsocial a process such as structural studies. I don't know, Luciana. Luciana. And let, me, let, me, let me add something because I think, uh, I, I, and I agree with most of what, uh, or no, everything that Juan Pedro has highlighted, but as well, this is not a process that is only uh, happening in Argentina. And we know that other studies in the region are looking uh, into uh, the peculiarities and the interesting new thing that can bring to reduce or to, you know, go from the macro level to a regional or local uh, strategy. And I'm thinking here in the work of Veronica Valdivia in Chile, I'm thinking here in Correa Morales, and, you know, there is a lot of works that are showing that what we can see and understand of this process in the 60s and 70s, if we look into the municipios, if we look into the regions, uh, it's different. And this has to do with a political, uh, 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 a, a characteristic of the political way which the dictatorships were, uh, you know, were run, which was obviously restricting all the national level of the politics and, you know, closing the Senate, closing the Congress and, go, and so on and so on. But they needed to do politics at one level. So they retreat to the local level. So it's very important, very interesting to see what was happening. And the same, I think, can be said in terms of industrial relations. So if in one hand we know that industrial relations, you know, were quite restricted in the national level, we found, and one of the chapters in this book is a very good show of this. I'm thinking in Daniel Di Cosimo's work. Uh, we, we can see that in the, in the local level, those employment relations were still needed and were still around. So if we change uh, the focus of the, uh, of the view, we will find this, that this you know, geographical scope is bringing new understanding of, of the dynamic of those years. And I think that really links to my next questions of how do you study this? And it's the methodological question in some ways. I think one of the things I found really amazing in most of the articles is how they um, try to find something that had been kept invisible for so long. You know, the people working on finding those like one day strike that were not recorded by the newspapers. So how do you um, go back to the local? How do you study into this factory related into these everyday issues that they were never really recorded. So in thinking more broadly also, what do you think is the methodological contribution of this book? How do we move from here to do other labor history? Because I like how you mentioned that, yes, the work of in, in other regions, but I haven't seen something like this for labor history in Chile. We're still a little bit behind on need to go back to the plant and look at those factories. So. Um, how do you see your uh, methodological proposal for other labor history in the region? Uh, it's, do you want Eddie to go first into, the, into part of how I, to do this? I can take a, a very small crack at it. And I may say some things that Luciana Montero, you, you will want to push back, which I would welcome. But one of the things that struck me as I've been working on this chapter and the larger project 
is how useful newspapers and media accounts actually are for all of the talk of censorship and for all of the sort of um, popular conception of the way that the press was muzzled during this period. There is a, a surprising amount of information uh, often having to be read against the grain, right? Often having to be sort of, you look for what's omitted from some of these accounts, you look for kind of the disconnects between the ways that um, stories of strikes, for instance, or labor conflicts are reported on. But it's been, it's been surprising to me how much press coverage some of these things got. And um, the other thing that I would mention is um, for those who are and this goes a little bit to the regional question, but for those who work in the greater Buenos Aires area, outside of the city of Buenos Aires, there's been a phenomenal recent development in the last eight years, 2014, when the Comisión de la Provincia um, opened its archives, the, the official police archives. But basically the Buenos Aires Provincial Police Department archives were handed over to a local NGO and became available for researchers. And so that's been one of the most important kind of methodological, um, I guess, advances that's allowed for a lot of the work in the greater Buenos Aires region. I want to highlight problems as well, but I think this, this will make this discussion uh, more interesting. <laughs> uh, so one of the problems is, yes, we have new archives, but most of them are related, as Eddie was saying, are related to the you know, forces acting in the repression. So in a way, they are bringing us back to the classical agenda, you know, how repression was, repression was done, you know, how, how the military uh, thought about the enemy they were confronting and so on and so on. And in my opinion, what we were trying to do and we, I think it's kind of agenda that our generation is bringing into this is trying to go beyond, uh, you know, the the some level of discussion and and recovering a more you know a different kind of problems and going you know going into seeing the workers and seeing these experiences and seeing other kind of workers as well. So moving and, and making this subject more rich, more complex. Uh, and this needs obviously opening to many other kind of uh, questions, methodological, obviously tools, uh, and, and bringing uh, back some complexity into this. If you ask me, and I'm going to be very crude on this, if you ask me if we achieve that in the book, I will say no. So the book is an effort in that direction, and I think it's a very valuable one, and I really appreciate the work that everyone has done on this. But I think we have a lot more to do in terms of, you know, bringing uh, a more rich, a more diverse uh, re representation of, of these experiences, uh, of these people, and who they were, how they suffer, how they change, how, you know, how were they marked by the dictatorship. So let me jump there with a follow-up question. When you said there are many things missing, um, what is missing? What do you think are the experience that were not covered? Well, I think I think one of the chapters is showing us some of what is missing uh, for for the positive one. I, I I hope he's listening around, which is uh, Jerónimo Pinedo. What is missing? We are missing a lot in labor studies in Argentina: the role of neighborhoods, the role of the community, the role of the family and those connections that if, if are important today, they were very, very important in the 70s. There are a few contributions in that sense. I think Federico Lorenz's work on Zona Norte, on the north of Buenos Aires, he did a very good effort in bringing back, you know, how, how kind of uh, the, the um, insertion, we say it in Spanish, I don't have the word in English for this, uh, the, the, Eddie, can you help me? No. <laughs> okay. The, 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 you know, the, 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 the whole full of links 
and connections that each worker put in, you know, in play when they were organizing, when they were protesting, when they were not protesting, uh, we have to bring it in. Another aspect that we have to bring in is gender and gender and how, you know, and again, in the Federico Lawrence work, you have some notes on how the, ma the masculinity of those workers were, were, was built and how it played a role in the violence and the construction of violence uh, within workers as you know, a part of their building of a group and then with the trade union and so on. So we have to bring more of that, I'm sure of that. And I don't think we, we achieve you know, those goals yet. And, and, and yes, and we have to bring the vida cotidiana. <laughs> we have to bring uh, the experiences that were not politically in the high but were important. And I think Eddie did a very good job on that. Eddie brings, for example, the representation of religious belief in protesting in Argentina and how, you know, some Catholic kind of spirit was around workers and their families when they were organizing. So all those things I think we have to bring in. Sorry, one thing. Yes. Uh, um, one of the difficulties uh, when studying resistance of and, and work during the dictatorship in Argentina was the theoretical stagnation in dichotomies such as immobility, uh, resistance, or combative bases and chaitous leaders. Um, it seems to me that the chapters of the book sh shows that the new generation of studies managed to overcome these kind of difficulties. And in on the other hand, many sources are still hiding because the repressor have, have hidden or perhaps destroyed or they are lost in the files in official agencies. And there are political and administrative difficulties that researchers, together with human rights organizations, have to resolve. Yeah. And um, I think, yes, and I want to think it made me think about also in this discussion of what is missing, but also more to celebrate and what is really there. One, and this is a question most I think for Ed, um, that is one thing that I found really fascinating, besides visibilizing the resistance of the old forms organization, is also how workers use some of the tools that exist or continue to exist, such as the law, to resist change or at least to accommodate or at least to survive. And I think it's fascinating because we tend to think about dictatorship sometimes as a place without law, a time that law are eliminated or don't really matter. But I think uh, some of the chapters and especially your chapter, it really shows that the law is still could be used. Um, I think there's a lot of connection with what happened with workers after the enforcement of the labor plan in Chile after 1978, that it was a tool to control, but workers also use it in their advance to organize and to resist, or at least to um, sort of confront the worst part of the dictatorship. So uh, what, can, what can you tell us, uh, I mean, about the law and why is it important to look at the law, even in context where laws are not really enforced that much? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that this is one of the things that's fascinated me the most about the subject since I started working on the topic. And I feel like, um, one of the things that I read early on that was uh, helpful in thinking about this was John French's book about the labor codes in Brazil and the way that workers over decades took a set of laws that wasn't necessarily aimed at helping them, that wasn't necessarily written for their benefit and turned it into the most important tool that they could use. And I do think that you're absolutely right that there is this assumption that authoritarian governments are somehow antithetical to the rule of law and yet, in the case of Argentina, as Luciana has shown in other work, so a lot of the laws, and as people are increasingly wrestling with, um, in the case of Argentina, a lot of the laws passed by the government, by the military dictatorship in the 70s and 80s, remain on the books until the 90s, the 2000s. Some of them are still technically in effect today. And so the idea that authoritarian regimes don't create laws is verifiably false, right? And so the question then is, what do those laws mean for the people who have to contend with them, right? And in what cases do folks find 
an aspect of that law that they can use and or push back against that law. The case that I looked at in the book of, of Deutsche Argentina uh, tractor factory was super fascinating because throughout all of the sides are invoking the dictatorship's laws. So the employers are claiming that the workers are violating laws passed by the dictatorship. The dictatorship, excuse me, the workers are claiming that the employers are violating laws. And then a federal judge comes in and rules on behalf of the workers. And so it is one of these, I think, exceptional cases in the existing historiography, but I'm not as sure that it is exceptional in the experience of workers during this time. I think that's an open question as to how much workers were able to make use of the law during this period. And, um, and I, I think there's so many, yes, right, it's not as exceptional, but the fact of being able to use the law in a dictatorship is very exceptional, I think. I mean, you can see that in Chile too, and maybe in Brazil too, but the fact that this workers are still, no, I don't know if they trust the law, but they were able to connect and they were able to access that. Um, I think it's a fascinating case and I, uh, I really enjoyed that discussion of bringing the law and labor laws and, uh, and also in some ways because it makes the whole experience of work much more complex in a sense that yes, there is resistance, but there is also negotiation. And I think that is an important um, discussion. So following a little bit um, on that is, um, I mean, most of the book is about, of course, about the dictatorship or the last dictatorship. As, um, but, but then thinking a little bit beyond that, especially because Argentina is a case where neoliberal reforms were imposed under democracy, or at least a big package of neoliberal reforms. Um, so two questions related to that is how the workers contribute to the return of democracy. Mm -hmm. So a more political question. And what were also connected to that? And maybe this is a very Chilean question, but what were the legacies of dictatorship? I mean, and how that explain how labor fell in the aftermath of dictatorship? So pushing you a little bit after the <laughs> 1980s. I, I'm going to go back. A little bit, just what something I was thinking related to the law. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. I will allow Juan Pedro, which is the guy who yeah. has to respond on the afters. Uh, but I can contribute if you want, Juan Pedro. But uh, I, I am interested in the in what Eddie is bringing in the chapter and and the discussion that this you know can I think can bring to to the whole you know uh, area of studies about the dictatorship and labor history as well. One of the things that I think has been uh, over, over analyzed, analyzed and you know, underdeveloped is how workers relate to the law in general. So this is a very interesting topic because we tend to see them in the conflicts. We tend to see them when the conflict is on the newspaper's front page, as they say, but we don't actually go back to how they understood these connections within the institutional, you know, and political network that is around uh, labor and employment relations. I did try to, to show in my chapter, and I think it's very well connected to this, that most of the pre-dictatorship uh, conflicts went into a paper at the end to ask the Ministry of Labor to recognize their rights to have you know, health and health and safety uh, regulation within work. So if we think in the Cordobazo in Argentina, this, you know, very big, um, 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 uh, uh, you know, um, full of life uh, conflict in the 60s, at the end of the 60s, again, the dictatorship, but also around, about bringing Perón's back and about, you know, uh, relating to the dreams of the Cuban revolution or what, you know, what could have, been seen as a nationalist, nationalist uh, uh, change of Argentina's uh, uh, trend and, and so on and so on. All this, you know, and, and, the, uh, and the workers being, you know, against the trade union bureaucracies and, and, and doing organizing in the, in, in the floor shop and so on and so on. That has been reconstructed, but if we 
but the fact that these workers are the during the period of uprising, during these protests, during this, you know, very vivid activity, went into the Ministry of Labour, fill a form, and asked the minister, the minister or the president, to recognize these, you know, these victories they have in the workplace is not always recognized, and it's obviously going to bring back questions about the mentality of this, these workers. It's going to bring back questions about how they understood the revolution. They, you know, some people said they were doing or were willing to do. It's going to bring back, as Eddie has shown in his work, questions about what is the understanding of legal or illegal or law when these exceptions are, you know, going going on and so i think we have a very very interesting uh set of things to see uh when we approach this and I, I again i think we can rediscover some of these processes if we go into this uh, this line of uh inquiry uh, eddie you have your hand up. i just yeah i just want to add one quick thing and then we will hand it over to juan pedro to talk about the the transition period that is an excellent and important question. But I also want to say that building off what Luciano was saying, the flip side of that is also that the dictatorship, though we tend to see it as this monolith, is made up of human beings who have their own understandings of the law and their own kind of um, interests and, and priorities vis-a-vis -vis its enforcement at different moments. And so there is this other side of that coin, which is that the armed forces or the people who are working in the government under the armed forces choose at times not to enforce certain provisions of the law, right? They selectively apply and selectively kind of follow um, and assign meaning to the law themselves. And so it makes it a, a very fascinating, but I don't want to say difficult, but like a complex relationship between multiple parties interpreting and reinterpreting a law in the context of a given conflict. And, and this brings us back, or oh, last, last comment on this, uh, about how the consensus for the dictatorship was being built actively during the process. So we cannot think it was only built, you know, when uh, the uh, government, the, the last Peronist government, government was falling down into economic crisis and political disarray and so on and so on. We have to think how they build and reproduce and, you know, gain consensus of the dictatorship throughout those years. And I think this is a question that is important for Argentina. It will go back to you, Angela, and think about the Chilean case is again important and it will go through the regions. So uh, I think we have, we have an interesting uh, you know, set of questions there that, in a way, it is uh, it is new. I think, Juan Pedro, on the eighties. Well, um, authors such as uh, Guillermo Donnell uh, charted uh, the crisis of the dictatorship uh, and the return of democracy as a crisis by, by collapse. No, uh, in other words, in, in in the fall of the military regime. Uh, many elements have to do with it, uh, issues such as the economic crisis, um, the result of the Malvinas War, the erosion of the consensus on the war against subversion, the constant questioning of human rights organizations such as mothers or grandmothers of, uh, of Plaza de Mayo, the internal fights between the various factions of the military government, um, the change of position of the majority political parties that began to openly question the military government and the labor movement played an important role in that crisis. For example, uh, the Leandro Molinaro's work shows the level of conflict among workers uh, during the last year of dictatorship at the level of workplaces. You know, leaders also played a role that in that crisis of dictatorship. If you look at the photo of, of the book, uh, when uh, three men, the change of women, that happened during the general strike with mobilization on March 30, 1982, to, uh, a few days before Martinez War. It was a great mobilization, a strike with important companies that showed the level of dissatisfaction of the working class with the military government. 
However, the labor movement, labor movement uh, did not appear in the new democratic context clearly as a champion of democracy. Uh, the collaboration of good part of the union leaders with the military regime and the favorable position of, uh, for the military self-amnesty of the Peronist candidate for the presidency uh, left the leadership of labor movement in a difficult position in the early 80s. Um, some union leaders such as Triaca, Racini, Valdacini witnesses uh, the defense of the military in the 1985 military trials and stated that they had been treated well during the imprisonment and that there had been no persecution or disappearance in the unions. So, uh, in, in one hand, you have this, this situation for the labor movement, but in the other hand, you have um, a new government's offensive about the labor law in, in the new democracy, who stand in the in the military law until 1998 um, because the labor movement stops this offensive um, of the new government so you have a, 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 a new scenario with, with uh, a lot of continuities with the with with the military dictatorship um, well, it, it, it's been a, a long to discuss it, and I have not prepared in English, so uh, we can reconstruct in, in other time. And I was going to, um, I mean, before that, I get you, Ed, uh, I think one of the things that made me think about what, what you said also, and it connects to what you said and I was mentioning is maybe that's the place where you need to bring not just the labor movement and the organized sort of the traditional way, but bring the community in. And I think when we start looking at the intersection between community organizing, human rights movement and workers, not necessarily as part of a traditional labor movement, we can see much better a uh, visibilized part the contribution were in the transition to democracy. And I think that is, um, I mean, probably change in how workers participate uh, or how they fought for democracy, maybe in another place, not necessarily in the most traditional way. Ed, you want to? Yeah, I also just wanted to add one other, again, complicating perspective, which is the um, Again, we talk about the dictatorship as if it is a unidirectional thing, and yet, as a lot of people have showed, Paulo Canelo, Canelo uh, most most recently, but that there are huge sectors of the dictatorship that don't agree with um, Martinez Sejos's neoliberal agenda, right? That are actively undermining him and publicly criticizing him, and so there's really interesting tensions within this, and so to it's, it's an to me, the way that I've sort of um, been thinking about this, and I would be curious to hear what uh, Lucian and Juan Pedro and others have to say, but as much as one, as much as um, Martinez Ejos kind of becomes associated with the economic program of the, the Proceso, to some extent, it, it happens despite him. I mean, it, to some extent, Argentina gets swept up in a broader global economic transformation, and it just so happens that he is the economy minister at that moment, but there is a huge sector of the military, more kind of desarrollista, developmentalist, that is very, very against the idea of privatizing national industry, right? Very against converting the economy to uh, finance capitalism, very against soliciting foreign investment. And so it's interesting that there is this narrative now that the neoliberalism of the 1990s is a direct result of the dictatorship but to some extent, that's it's it's less clear to me that that was the intent or the only intent of the proceso itself. Um, so moving a little bit out of Argentina, and I want to um, raise some transnational question because I know um, at least Luciana, you have done a lot of work with the international. I mean, most of the book is about 
work experience in Argentina, but I'm curious about the transnational connection. Uh, how can we, I mean, what was the importance of international organizations? How did they influence or how they help workers to access some form of justice, uh, at least international justice? Um, did this effort have any impact? Um, how can we think about Argenti um, Argentinian labor history in a more transnational way? Well, obviously, I am very interested in in how it impacted. One thing is because what was Eddie was saying that we tend to, in Argentina and I think in Latin America and probably elsewhere as well to think in in history as national history first, and I think that you know that has been criticized a lot, and there is a lot of demonstrations that. We actually need to think in a global labor history. We actually need to think in the region as well to understand, for example, the neoliberal agenda and how it was found and encountered and contested and discussed and not only applied as, as Eddie was highlighted. And I think the same, you know, the, the same thing applied when, when we think in labor history. So the the I didn't work on this in this book, but uh, yes, I have done work on Argentinian workers, transnational connections, and how they, you know, acted during the dictatorship. And this brings only complexity to their picture. So I will ask the audience, the small audience we have to, to, today with us, to be patient on this, because I, I'm going to map this response in a way. So first thing we have traditional Peronist Orthodox trade unions that were somehow connected to the international, especially US federations and unions. And they were acting actively as many unions in Latin America in the international labor organization in Geneva. And uh, those were, you know, let's say, pretty much stable connections between Argentinian labor movement and, and international labor movements. But the, the very peculiar thing was that when the dictatorship in Argentina started in March 1976, the international trade unions came to the Argentinian unions and says, how can we help you? You know. How can we help you to deal with this terrific, the, ter sorry, not terrific, this, you know, traumatic situation you are going through? And international trade union had in their minds the Chilean experience because Chilean trade unions were very active, and you know this, Angela, uh, very active in the international arena from 1973 onwards. And they were causing a lot of trouble to Pinochet in the international sphere. But the Argentinian trade unions in the 76, 77, 78, 9, 80 were actually asking international unions to be more quiet on the topic. And they, they went to, for example, the ILO to say, okay, what is happening in Argentina is actually an Argentinian problem. Just, you know, and I have access and I did a publication on this. Uh, um, and, 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 and a new chapter is coming on the ILO and Chile and Argentina differences uh, in the in the you know following probably next few months in a book coordinated by uh, Sandrine Cott and other colleagues that are working on the ILO history. So uh, when the international community was expecting denunciations from trade unions in Argentina, trade unions in Argentina, especially this very big branch of Peronist right wing. Uh, Orthodox unions were saying, actually, you know what, just keep it quiet. And they were saying, keep it quiet because the repression was first targeting lefty, left wing unions and trade unionists from the, you know, from the workplaces, which were actually causing problems to trade unions in Argentina and trade unions politics. So, we have very complex, a very complex link between these international uh, denunciations and activity and the trade unions. Then we have the exiles of the trade unions of Argentina acting abroad. And then obviously we have another picture there because they were very active. They joined efforts with Chilean 
and you know uh, exiles and with visual agents and so on. They acted in Mexico, they acted in Brussels, they acted here in the UK, they acted in Geneva and in France and so on and so on. And so we have a section of the labor movement in Argentina that did try to reach the international organization, did try to gather information and you know make known what was happening and to put pressure on the government. But this was obviously not a balanced fight because trade unions in Argentina were way more powerful than exiles, uh, individual figures in the international, the international arena. The actions of solidarity, which is, I think is part of your questions, well, there were many and they were important. The dictatorships, both the Chilean, the Argentinian, the Uruguayan one, were very, very worried about the effects of these campaigns. And if we see this from now, we can say, okay, these were kind of very, you know, uncoordinated and tiny in a way, you know, very, uh, amateur kind of campaigns in a way, but they build resistance, they build knowledge on what was happening, and all the dictatorships, you know, uh, have a very clear um, agenda regarding these solidarity uh, actions, and they were very active in trying to, you know, uh, downplay uh, the role of these, to con contest in many ways what they were saying, to to act with the long hand of repression as well, and so on. So they, they were, I think they were important. To conclude on this, if we look into what the effect of the internet, what this picture of what happened in the international arena can bring, it will bring a lot of new things again to, uh, to, to thinking what happened in the labor movement during the dictatorship. It brings a lot of complexity it brings a lot of, you know, I, I saw the other day companies in the COP26 are greenwashing. Well, we can think trade unions after the dictatorship in Argentina did some kind of greenwashing about their role during the dictatorship. And, and, and in a way, if we go into the documents, if we go in what they said in the international arena, if we go into what they did at those events, we will find a more complex and, 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 you know, yes, uh, uh, a picture of, of their action that is way more, uh, less, less nice, less naive than what they say today. Thank you, Luciana, for that broad overview of international. I think it's very helpful, and I think that it helps to understand the place of Argentina in connection also to the struggle of other workers in Chile and Brazil that were also trying to access international help. Um, before we, we open for questions, I have a very brief question that I want to ask maybe all of you. Um, and basically, if you can tell us from your own research or your own case, what did it mean? to be a worker in under dictatorship. If you can tell us what were the main issues, uh, if you can summarize for people um, what it means to work and to live um, as a blue collar worker in Argentina during dictatorship. Ed, you can start. <laughs> I might start uh, somewhere else. So in the broader project, I have case studies of which the, the Deutz tractor factory is one, but one of them is in the interior in Argentina, in the in the province of La Pampa, in a relatively small town called um, General Pico. And I work with telephone workers and that chapter is based mostly on oral histories that I collected. And so one of the things that's interesting about that chapter is that it runs counter to a lot of what we might assume about the dictatorship. And I know that this is part of uh, going back to what you raised earlier, the geographical scope of things like repression and things like um, economic transformation. But what struck me was that for telephone workers who were public sector workers, blue collar workers um, who worked for the state telephone company in this province, their recollection and their experience of the dictatorship, I don't wanna say that nothing changed because that's not exactly what I, how I interpret their testimony, but 
but they have crafted a narrative in which the dictatorship didn't represent a firm rupture. And to some extent, I think that that, um, and again, tying into the question of neoliberalism, to some extent that that reflects the trauma of the privatization of the state company. And so it's interesting that some of these workers for them, the moment that as an outsider or someone who didn't live through the dictatorship, you might assume that that was the most traumatic thing that happened to them. And yet there is obvious evidence that for a lot of people, the 1980s with hyperinflation, um, the other crises that followed the end of the dictatorship, privatization and the Menem years, the 2001 economic collapse, that there are these other markers that have shaped how people recollect and how people kind of talk about their own experiences during that period. Yeah, Juan Pedro, you want to, maybe in the material conditions? Well, uh, the common experience of workers was your wage are low. Some of your partners in the workplace uh, uh, passed to unemployment. Um, the, hmm, the, the, um, concentration of uh, factories in uh, local places uh, were, was turned in um, um, the, you work a lot more than earlier after dictatorship. There is a, a, a good synthesis of all experience of workers uh, after the last dictatorship. I, I am going to jump in on some of the, I think, broad characteristics. And I want to agree with, uh, with both of you guys, because uh, yes, there was this mix of things. On one hand, a lot of workers, as you know, was saying in testimonies in work in research, and that actually not everything changed for them or not very important things changed for them. And I, I'm going to, you know, put in this record some nice works about this. And this is, for example, Eleonora Vretal work on, on common people, common workings. And this is said with, you know, quotations. Uh, you know, I'm a common person. It didn't change for me. This was a problem of those that were within the politics. And so we have a very rich thing to think about here. And again, this is related to how these people then perceive the law, for example, because they, in a way, could have seen the dictatorship as something happening for those within politics and those within, you know, uh, involved in political struggle. So we have on the one hand, and we have what Juan Pedro said in the other. We have a more tense workplace. We have a new imbalance in the employment relations uh, thing. We have more power for employers everywhere in the country. We have uh, a break, an important break in the organization of labor and, lab you know, and, and, and workers' traditions and trade unions and workplace organization. We have a break, we have a gap, we have a, a crack we, that was done around the country, everywhere in those terms. And we have the legal, uh, like uh, the legal, um, uh, you know, structure that they uh, left for the country. We have uh, restricted labor rights. We have less, you know, uh, less rights for workers everywhere. And we have all these uh, new laws that they started to play around how workers could organize. And we have, and this is uh, related to the imbalance, this is related to the laws, we have a different discipline within the workplaces. And this was one of the key aspects of the dictatorship, and it, it, it can be highlighted as one of the you know, main, uh, main fruits of it, which was changing the relationship between the society and the politics, changing the relationship between the classes and discipline uh, the working class and the expression of popular classes in the country. And this is seen not only within the workplaces, this is seen outside as well. In a last note, and I will pass it to, to you, Eddie, 
this was not perfect. This was not compact enough. And we have seen during the, the dictatorship protests, we have seen strikes, we have seen the organization of human rights movements, you know, especially the mothers, the abuelas, etc. So the cracks were there and left a society that is still very able to mobilize. But those things changed anyway. Eddie, sorry. No, I would only add just um, in addition to the changes that you enumerated, that, that there's also this thing that, that I know that anyone who works with, say, oral histories from this period has to contend with, which is the, the creation of a climate of fear, right? Not just um, the fear of losing your job or not just the fear of sort of having your wages docked or something like that. There is the physical possibility of, of violence in a way that isn't necessarily there in previous or subsequent eras. And even though it doesn't necessarily touch everyone personally, it exists at a, at a level that makes it very hard to contend with. And so even I want to make myself clear that even when I talk about testimonies where workers say that, oh, not so much changed, or as Luciana said, that was something that happened to the more politically involved people, it's important to have in mind how much of that is a reflection of, uh, of an internalized trauma, right, of the idea of living through this experience, um, that necessarily kind of curtails your possibilities for expression. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna open up for questions and I'm reading from the chat. Our first question is from Thai Xavier Carvalho. Um, I was wondering if Edward could talk a little bit more about the Brazilian law case he mentioned and if the panelists could talk about possible common communication points they see between the Argentine dictatorship and other dictatorships in Latin American country. Um, so yeah, very briefly, the, the work that I mentioned is John French's Drowning in Laws, um, in which he analyzes this collection of labor laws that was passed under the dictatorship of Getulio Vargas in um, maybe in 1942 or 1943. It's, it's called the um, Consale das Leyes do Trabalho, something like that. Um, and it was a set of labor laws that the Vargas government enacted that were meant to sort of bind the unions and the working class to the Vargas administration. It was meant to sort of be a, a tool by which the government could use the workers and use working class organizations. And yet over the years, that um, set of laws, the CLT, became the most important and fundamental tool for Brazilian workers to assert their own rights, even during the subsequent military governments, especially the, the longest dictatorship from 64 um, into the 80s. And so that's what I was referencing, the way that workers kind of can take things that weren't necessarily meant for their benefit and repurpose them, that there are these opportunities to use the law, that it can be a tool for, for other kind of um, actions. And I'll open it up to Luciana and Juan Pedro if you if either of you would like to talk about connections with other dictatorships that we see I know we covered a little bit of that ground but Juan Pedro do you want to jump or no <laughs> okay uh well it's obviously a very interesting and difficult question uh because there are many things that can be bring in when we think in you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the wave of dictatorships that, you know, were around uh, South America uh, during the, you know, the end of the 60s and the 70s, the Brazilian one being a little bit before. Uh, I think one of the things that we can agree is that in all of them, the role and the importance of labor is still to be recognized. And this is an important uh, issue here uh, that we, we still need uh, to, to build a transnational understanding of the role of labor for those dictatorships and this capital uh, labor conflict for, this, for the building of the agenda of these dictatorships. Because obviously there is, there is a gap here. The dictatorships, the Argentinian one, the Brazilian one, the Uruguayan one, 
uh, the, the Chilean one, were very active saying, you know, our war is an unconventional, unconventional, unconventional war against terrorism, against communism, and so on and so on. So they were framed in a discourse that was partly given to them by the US and, uh, and, and regional plans, but on a, on a deeper level, the agendas were very national. We're very national in terms of discipline, as we discussed. We're very national in terms of making progress in the, for businesses, for restructuring, for, for political imbalances, or you know, new, new organizations of the political sphere, and so on and so on. So we have to, to tune this. There is a lot of progress in this, uh, in this uh, sense. I'm thinking here in a dossier that Peter Wynn organize about labor and dictatorships in Latin America, in which Angela has participated, and also a good colleague from Argentina, Victoria Pasualdo. And I don't remember who is from Brazil, Angela, but that's a dossier that has been produced, I don't maybe two years ago, and has discussed these issues. We, you know, Brazilian colleagues has organized around Mundo do Trabalho, uh, my uh, journal as well as some works. So there is progress on this field. And I think there is a lot of things to, to, to discuss. Uh, and then you have obviously all the connected to the way the dictatorship acted uh, research, because obviously there was repressive coordination, there was diplomatic coordination among them. And so some of those agendas were as well uh, connected. I hope this kind of replies to the to the question. Can I, can I think oh, into that? Uh, can, can I just jump in really quickly? So it, it's a little bit yes. after four. We still have a couple minutes left uh, for anybody interested in sticking around and conversing a bit more. Um, I uh, wanted to, I'll, I'll sort of, I'll do the kind of final thanks to everybody in a second, but I wanted to ask uh, quickly, uh, on, on, uh, sorry, um, Luciana and Juan Pedro, uh, about the experience of, of publishing this through Contra Corriente, through University of North Carolina Press. So one of the things that's really exciting to me is that this, this, this publishing initiative exists, that UNC Press is publishing sort of Spanish language, Latin American and, uh, and Caribbean studies focused work. And so I'd love to hear just a few uh, words about that experience and, and how it worked out. Um, and also just while I'm uh, talking to shamelessly plug the, um, the fact that they've generously offered us this um, um, discount uh, if you are excited about this book and want to order a copy uh, um, at any point during the month of December, um, you can go directly to the press website, uh, which we posted in the original announcement and we'd be happy to share again use the promo code that they gave us and use that to uh, do the book work. So we're, we're really thankful that they've offered us this opportunity, uh, but, but tell us a little bit about that experience. Um. Uh, first, thank you, Daniel, because you, you are very well organized. You remember <laughs> to bring this code into the talk, which is, which is <coughs> lovely. Um, let me say something. It's not easy to find how to publish these books. This is a book that has, that doesn't provide a single voice because it, you know, it has 18 authors working together. It's, uh, it's not, you know, perfectly organized. It's not completely uh, bringing a coherent narrative into the topic. It's a, it's a conversation, it's a discussion, uh, it's an open talk. So it's difficult to find who published, published this. Then you have the complexity of Argentina to play with. <laughs> Because obviously it was very difficult because Argentina is going again through a very economic, uh, you know, uh, crisis, a very complex one. There is no resources, no funding for publishing. I, I, if you go into the introduction of the book, we dedicated this book with Juan Pedro to all the colleagues that are not finding any positions because the whole budget for research has been cut dramatically during the last Macri government. So it wasn't easy. But then someone from the University of London told me, Luciana, you should look at these books that these guys in North Carolina are publishing about labor history. And I was surprised to find, you know, there is 
people interested in these topics and they were kind enough to you know review the proposal and, and help us through the publication. Again, it's not always easy to find um, someone who supports a book which is not bringing a single voice, uh, you know, a closed research with all the responses to questions and so on. But we did find that openness and that kindness and that interest in Latin America labor history in a contra corriente. And we are really, really glad to have found them. And the patience of Greg and, and Carlos, uh, Greg Do and Carlos Aguirre, who had a, a big generosity and patience with the corrections and re-corrections and new corrections about every chapter. I had one year of work and, and the book is, uh, I think, a very good book. Uh, with this great quantity of work in, in here. So maybe now out of an abundance of respect for the fact that Luciana is calling from six hours in the future, we'll move toward the end of the event. So I, I think we have time for one last question or comment if anybody has anything yes. that they I like. think there was one question left on the chat um, from Sandra Mendiola. Why did part of the military regime oppose the neoliberal turn? What was exactly it that they opposed and why? Well, one, one of the things is a part of uh, the, the ideology of the military was the national security doctrine. Uh, which, among other issues, argued that it was necessary to preserve certain areas of the economy in charge of the state. So they opposed policies such as privatizations. Uh, at the same time, state-owned uh, companies involve a significant amount of money uh, for the military in charge to handle. So they were not very willing to stop handling that amount of money. I think uh, uh, I, I, I agree, and it, it, it was related to the character of the, the of the military, because there is a section, there was a section of nationalism in the military that was not very keen on, as Juan Pedro said, you know, just uh, leaving uh, space for for the international capital and for you know changing the, the kind of rules of the country and you can see that in because the person is asking here and it's very good question Sandra thank you for this how how they did exactly opposed and why and one of the things you can see and again we go back into the law <laughs> sorry for being repetitive here but you can see for example that they have at the same time an opening of the economy and a liberalization of the financial market and so on and so on. And in the other, the promotion of the industries, protection of sections of the industry in the old way. So you can see that that dispute was going, uh, was going on. Uh, there is again, good words about this. I'm going to cite Juan Rijera works on the promotion of industries during the dictatorship. And, but there are many, and I think this is a vivid, uh, way of showing that the dictatorship was not monolithic and that the military has agreements. One of them was repression. I think in the foundations of that agreement of repression was discipline and working class discipline, but not in all the, all the other aspects, they were in an agreement. And if we go into the documents, and now we have plenty of the documents of the government, including the reports of the, the, the internal secret reports of their meetings that were found, I think, around five, six years ago. Uh, and you can see they were disagreeing in very key elements of how to build the next Argentina, how to build, you know, how to do this restructuring. There was not a monolithic agreement. And, and I guess that just as a last thing, that's what I would say is that maybe what I was trying to say earlier and wasn't able to express correctly, there is this idea that the Argentina of the 1990s was the intentional product of the policies of the Proceso. But in fact, it, it one did follow the other, but it wasn't necessarily the world that the Proceso 
hoped to build, right? And so there is this disconnect between um, the, the tremendous ability of this military government to undermine and destroy the existing systems of labor relations. And then they're somewhat tenuous and ineffectual attempt to rebuild something to take its place, um, something that would have legitimacy that people would buy into. And Luciano has shown that in some cases there's more buy-in and in some cases there's less buy-in, but it, the idea that the neoliberal trend follows the dictatorship, again, I, I do tend to think it's a product of Argentina's situation in a broader global sense than it is the, the achievement of some objective. And I think that uh, just jumping uh, before we close, um, it's really fascinating to bring the comparison with Chile. Um, but also because the Chilean dictatorship is longer and it's not that the Chilean dictatorship could really figure out how to transform labor um, in the first five years. I mean, they destroyed, destroyed, destroyed. And the first labor loss only came by 1978. So there is a time of destruction, but not really a clarity of how you're gonna build a new neoliberal system. So I think bringing to those two cases to together is, uh, is especially fascinating. So I think we're reaching to the end, Dan. Um, but before I pass it to you, I just want to thank everybody for being here, especially the authors okay. coming from very far away. I want to thank the uh, Indiana University for hosting us and all of you for uh, having a Chilean labor historian uh, commenting and moderating <laughs> this. And I hope I make any sense with the questions as I'm reading from a different um, side of the Andes. Uh, I'll, ju I'll just uh, uh, um, piggyback off what Angela said and thank everybody so much for agreeing to participate in this event and experimenting uh, with us to sort of thank the gods of technology for allowing our tricontinental signals to all more or less flow for the uh, past hour uninterrupted. That was really amazing and not something that I counted on automatically. And um, it sounds like Angela just um, informally agreed to come back soon and do, and do another sort of presentation. So we'll be excited to be in touch with you about sort of more uh, collaborations down the road. But to everybody, thank you so much for uh, participating, for, for producing this fabulous and fascinating piece of work and for the provocative discussion. Uh, it was a real pleasure to be able to host this and we hope that everybody has a lovely weekend. So. Uh, cheers, all. Oh, let me just quickly add. Um, uh, we I put this up earlier, but um, we um, have been collecting um, responses to our events. So, if anybody uh, panelists or audience members who's uh, still around and listening to me, uh, if you have a chance, we would love to get your feedback, uh, not just on this particular event, but other sorts of events that you would like to see formats that. Uh, you're more or less interested in. So uh, let me just say in advance that we appreciate all of the feedback and information that you provide and for your fines atenciones. And uh, we'll see everybody again soon. <laughs>